slowly as we started here, started. Shamai, welcome. Uh, today we've got an interview with Ollie from Burn. Uh, I'm not sure on his uh, surname there, but that's a uh, good offset, which we all like. He's uh, on Twitter as at um, Gurgle, G U G O L. Uh, and we're going to be speaking about macaroons and um, Burn and the, the Bitcoin scene in Burn, and then also some of the some of the things they've built down in Burn as well. So um, Ollie built quite very early on, actually. He built the self built the self service uh, coffee point in Burn, so you could go up to this the coffee shop window, you could uh, type in what you wanted, like cappuccino, and then you could click um, to show a QR. You pay the QR. And then it would it, the, the the barrister would then make the cappuccino. You go in and just pick up the cappuccino. Um, so really, ni really nice, neat system. And then another thing they made as well. Uh, um, I, I think Ollie, yeah, Ollie and, and and sort of his some of his friends down in Burn, they made a beer tap, uh, like a self service beer tap, which was at the Lightning Hack Day in Munich, um, which was very very popular. Um, and uh, uh, with the, with with that, you could just pay for pay the pay the the, the lightning transaction, and then it, you know put your glass in it would it would pour out beer. It was cool as well because like everyone was learning how to pour a decent a decent beer. <laughs> <laughs> we, we made a bit of a mess, but um, I guess it's about you know Bitcoin is all about giving people autonomy and sovereignty. So being able to like pour your own beer is probably one of those things which we could argue is um, makes you more of a sovereign individual. Um, so yeah, so I wanted to talk to uh, um, Ollie specifically because he did a talk on macaroons, and um, you know, I'm still fuzzy on what macaroons are and how they work. Um, and then some of the things he mentioned in his talk were very interesting to me because um, uh, he talked about custom macaroons. So uh, so yeah, so so Ollie, so I'm going to ask that generic question, like just to kind of get it all started. Uh, but how did you get into Bitcoin um, and, um, and and Lightning and this this entire space? Yeah, uh, I am a software engineer, so I heard of Bitcoin quite early on. Uh, but I, I don't know. Uh, I ask myself that uh, every time. Why didn't I enter early? It actually took a friend of mine to introduce me, uh, early uh, 2017. And he told me, look, you really have to have a look at this. You, you have to. There's no way around it. And I did. And then I yeah, uh, <laughs> went down the rabbit hole. I did uh, the deep dive uh, from the technical side because I uh, I really wanted to know how it works, so I really looked through the code and everything. Um, yeah, and uh, then, yeah, I also played around with shit coins a little bit, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, it, because of, from the technical side, it's interesting to see all these variables and all these coins playing around with them. But then the realization that, yeah, Bitcoin got all of them right that the first time was, was like a revelation and uh, yeah. So uh, I uh, started almost two years ago, uh, but then uh, around one and a half years ago, um, someone in my company, uh, I'll actually our CTO noticed that and told me, hey, bring us a use case and I'll get you some budget. And I did. And what I brought was uh, the, the Lightning Network that this could really have potential. And there was uh, late 2017 where there was no mainnet implementation yet. Uh, so it was really early, but I I saw a huge potential in that. So I yeah brought that to our company and we got a little bit of budget and this is actually what we used to then build the the self order uh point of sale uh, with energy kitchen so we did that from our internal budget that's um, um, that's, that's very swiss isn't it because in um in uh, in switzerland you, you you live in kind of a different much more hospitable environment when it comes to bitcoin and the very fact that your company said to you because you're interested in bitcoin they said well you know bring us a use case and then um, build something they gave you a budget that's so unusual so the sort of thing which just wouldn't happen out there in anywhere else except switzerland i think well we're, we're a software company classic software company uh but we focus on on open source so whenever we build something we try to build it with uh, open source components uh and also if the client agrees to open source the result so this kind of fit fit well into our philosophy because everything in bitcoin and lightning is open source and there's a huge community and we wanted to yeah be able to to help build something so it was maybe that that helped in um yeah getting us some budgets too and um but one of the first things we actually did was uh more or less like a proof of concept to enable all, all 
um, our employees to get part of their salary in Bitcoin. That was, that was actually our first project. So you can choose every month between zero and up to 25% of your salary to get it in Bitcoin. So yeah, but yeah, maybe maybe it was easier in a Swiss company to get get something going like that. But I don't know. Yeah, I mean, for 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 some of the views you don't know, I know Switzerland. Um, how because you you've had like a, a tradition of, of decentralization, haven't you, in Switzerland, really? Yeah, you could say so with uh, all the cantons and uh, all the, the the cities having their own uh, political system. Yeah, you could say that. I'm I'm not that into politics, so I couldn't <laughs> go into more detail. But uh, I guess it's it it looks like uh, this. Yeah, more more centralized governance. But I mean, it's it's one of the it's one of the I think out of all the world's examples of decentralized governance, and then um, Switzerland is probably one of them. And whatever I've, I've I've seen a whole bunch of like um, little documentaries and things from some of the cantons and some of the the governors and whatever the the the, the, the people uh, uh, and and they they they're often very favorable to, to to Bitcoin and Bitcoin, and obviously a lot of Bitcoiners and cryptocurrency people seem to move out to Switzerland. Although I think that's probably for tax stuff, I guess. Yeah, we have we have a nice tax law that just basically declares Bitcoin as uh, just property, and property tax is very low. So yeah, maybe that attracts a few cryptocurrency people as well. Yeah. So then, from the the coffee machine, you then uh, made the the beer tap. Was that more of a like a DIY hack thing, or was that part of the company as well? Or? Um. I didn't help because after the, I did the beer tap, uh, no, sorry, uh, the, the, the um, self-order thingy, I needed some vacation. So I went on vacation and uh, the, my colleagues at the company built it then. So it was, was uh, our CTO again, uh, who was also interested in hardware. He, he ordered the stuff together with uh, other people and they, they built it. Uh, they used the same backend software. So the, the thing that we now open sourced as uh, the Zeus server uh, powers. What's that What's that Zeus, again? like the the god of a uh, Greek god of thunder. Um, yeah. This uh, the, there's a mobile app that's called the same. We decided on a name quite early on, but never published. So we have this name collision there. But it's it's independent from the mobile app. It's the software that powers both the the self order screen and the beer tap, and so it's really available. People can people can search that and they can start implementing their own. Um, uh, exactly. Uh, yes. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know about that. Um, and is because uh, the beer tap is the beer tap like a is it a slight is it a node running in the beer tap or is it kind of like no it's it connects to web interface so we actually have two parts uh, of software running on it. it it's a Raspberry Pi with a display uh, one part is just a browser displaying the web interface with the QR code and there's a second application running on it connecting to a web socket and it receives all the paid invoices. And if there's an invoice that has a certain prefix uh, to identify it as a beer tap invoice, then it just opens, uh, triggers a uh, uh, valve to open for a few seconds. Yeah, so that's that's something I need I need to look into the WebSocket thing because I'm, I'm at the moment all my devices are so goofy because um, they 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 request an invoice. And then they're just saying to the to the, the node, has it been paid? 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 And they're just spamming the node. So, um, so I'll have to look into that. How to do that myself? Is, yeah. Is, is it easy to set up or? Yeah, pretty easy. Uh, we also published a, a whole part list and the whole setup and the whole um, WebSocket stuff in a separate GitHub repo as well for the beer tab. So if you go to our uh, puzzle, uh, that's our company, uh, puzzle github.com slash P-U-C-E-L-E. Um, there you find both the Sioux server and the instructions for the beer tap. And well, you should find all the code there that you need. That's, that's pretty sweet. So that means people, so the audience right now, they could go on there, order the parts, make themselves a, a lightning powered beer tap. Nice. Exactly, yes. <laughs> I like that. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna, probably <laughs> going to do that. Um, uh, so, yeah, so Macaroon. So you, you did a talk um, at the Lightning Hack Day in Munich, um, and it was on Macaroons. It's probably worth, because we use the word we 
you know, back the word the, the macaroon around a lot, but not many people really understand what a macaroon is and where it came from. Did it come out of Google on a macaroon? Is that where it came from originally? Uh, yeah, I think it was a paper um, from some Google employees and also some students from uh, Brown University. Uh, the paper was published in 2014, so it's been around for a few years, but I haven't yet seen anyone using them except for L&D. So I, I was new for me as well when uh, I, yeah, I learned about them because of L&D. So, yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of us, we just assumed that, like, it came out of L&D. Um, uh, yeah. But it's, it's interesting that, you know, someone obviously, they, they, came up with this concept and wrote this paper on this thing on these sort of customizable cookies um and there hasn't really been a use case for them until until lightning comes along and then you know, there's this big use case where they're, they're really really applicable um so so what, what, if you could summarize uh like a, what a macaroon actually is to somebody in layman's terms in just like a short paragraph so what, what what is a macaroon yeah, it's basically just a, a blob of data that also has a signature on it. So there's a private key involved, uh, the, the root key that only the, the issuer um, keeps. Uh, so it, it needs to be private and it resides on the server somewhere. And you sign a piece of data and then attach the signature and you all uh, serialize that into a binary, binary uh, blob. But the interesting thing is you um, do the signature in a way that you can add more data to the macaroon, like your uh, what data we can uh, discuss later, and recreate the signature because you take the, the existing signature as a key for the uh, HMAC of the next round. So the HMAC is, is um, um, the hash message authentication. So it basically makes a hash of a message, but also adds a key to it. So it's authenticated with a key. So for every time you add something to the macaroon, you take the previous signature as the key and then hash the new piece of data through it. And then you get the new signature and you only attach the new signature. So if you don't know the root key or any of the previous signatures, you cannot take away data. So you can, everyone who has a macaroon can add data to it, but nobody can remove data if they don't know the private key. So only the server knows the private key and the server can validate the whole chain but nobody can take away stuff. And uh, what that allows is you can, uh, the, 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 the start of the macaroon is, is just the, the binary and identification, like a binary blob of data, but then you can add um, so-called caveats. And that's just a, a, a form of restriction. So you can say, yeah, I have this macaroon, but I want it to be only valid for one month. And then you add this caveat that says valid until and then a date and then you hash that uh, and you get the new signature. And when you send out the new macaroon, you only add the new signature. So um, nobody knows the, the previous signature, even though you might know it, but if you send it out, you only touch the latest. So nobody can take away this restriction. Um, but someone can go ahead, okay, I have this macaroon that is valid only one month, but I want to now send it over the network, so I add my IP address, so anyone who intercepts it through the network can only use it from my computer. So anyone in the chain can add more restrictions, but you cannot take away them, uh, any of them if you're not the server or the issuer of the, the macaroon. And uh, that that can be pretty powerful. And the, the way it is currently implemented in in LND is that um, you have uh, a list of operations you're allowed to do. So, like that, the, there are three uh, macaroons that are always generated. You might have uh, uh, seen them when you've played around with LND. So, there's the admin macaroon, and as it says, it, it has a list of all the operations there are uh, in um, 
So if you use that one, you can do anything. And there's also the, the read-only macaroon that only has uh, read access. And this list of operations you're allowed to do, that's in the ID part of the macaroon. So the, the, the root part. And um, then you can, you can add restrictions. And what the LNCLI software does, so the command line interface, it always adds a restriction of uh, 60 seconds validity. So every time LNCLI sends your macaroon over the network, it actually restricts it to only uh, be valid for uh, 60 seconds. So if anyone intercepts your macaroon, they have to be quick to use it. So that's, that's a security feature there. There's a second caveat that is currently possible. I don't think anyone is actually using it. It's uh, you, if you do an LNCLI uh, command, you can also say uh, macaroon IP and then type in an IP address, and then it will also restrict your macaroon to this IP address. So this is already implemented. You could use it, although by default, it's not, not in use. So what, so what, um, so what use case? I mean, yeah, so you have the three macaroons, you've got the admin, you've got the read, and you've got the invoice. And like I say, the, like, one of the last projects I did was the little, um, uh, again, a little ESP32 to go and fetch information about the node, just like its name and how many channels it's got, and then display on a little uh, uh, display. And for that, I just used the read only. And then when you actually look at the macaroon size as well, the admin macaroon's bigger and the read only one's smaller, because I suppose the, the admin macaroon's got more, yes, they can do this, 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 this. And then the read only is like, yeah, they can do this. And that's just what exactly. Um, exactly. Um, so with restricting it to an IP address, um, uh, that would be, a, 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 say that would be a fourth macaroon, which is, is possible. Um, uh, what, what, any, is, what use case could you use that for, do you think? Is there anything you can think of? Or? Uh, with the IP address specifically or, or in general? Yeah. Um, with, yeah. Yeah, for IP address, it's it's uh, basically security. So if you're not sure if the channel you're sending it over is uh, is secure or encrypted or whatever, it, it just um, makes it harder for someone to steal and use your macaroon. So that's that that's just a security feature. The both of these. Um, caveat conditions that are implemented, the, the time and the IP address, they're both uh, basically for security purposes. But uh, because you can add more um, of these caveat conditions, you can use more features with the macaroons. And that's what, what I did. I implemented uh, several pull requests for L&D that add new, um, new caveat conditions. So you can add more restrictions or more specific restrictions. One of them is also a bit more uh, security focused that you can also add a, a hash of all your request data. So if you make a request and have some parameters like uh, open channel to this node, you can hash all of them and then add a restriction to the macaroon saying, yeah, you can only use the macaroon for this specific request with these parameters. So someone um, taking your macaroon can only replay the same, uh, the, the, the same command. Or what you could do with that, and that was actually a, an idea I had, uh, someone else had uh, when I was talking to him uh, the previous day, that yeah, you could also, not do the request yourself, but give someone this macaroon that uh, basically has a hash over open channel to this specific node, and they could only do this. So you could give someone the ability to open a channel from your node to, to somewhere, but restrict it to one specific command. So you could, you could delegate some uh, access to your node with very specific commands. Um, yeah, that's that's uh, one of these um, caveat conditions I added. And uh, the second one that I think might be even more interesting is uh, a concept of, of accounts. So you, on L&D, you would have uh, a, a new uh, list of, of accounts where you can create an account and give them a balance. 
and it, it's all just virtual. It's like a new uh, database uh, in, in L&D. But you could create an account, give it some balance, and then restrict a macaroon to this account. Wow. And then someone who talk about being your own bank, that's the more. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you could then create a macaroon that is locked to this account and give this macaroon to someone from your family, for example. They could use your note and spend money from your note, but only up to this amount that you have locked. So I could. So my my kids, I could give them uh, uh, pocket money. They could have they could have access to the account. And they could, they exactly. Could this, this much. Per a week as well um and then they just don't have access and then when they spend it they have to wait until it's yeah that's a po possible caveat would you say exactly yeah that's i implemented the very basic uh, functionality for this um once it's merged i will add uh, more features at the moment there's no recurring balance it's just a one-time balance could you, use that, could you use that for like a direct debit then like the, to, to simulate a direct debit where you give them access to that channel um so you give them the macaroon which has a restricted amount on like an account and then they have the ability to be able to spend that amount um which means they could so they can take that amount say every month so you could have like a repeat payment thing for like a phone contract or something that was actually the original idea to implement uh, or to to enable recurring payments and i have to say that that's not my idea it's uh the person, uh, Alex Oxelrod, who initially implemented Macaroons in L&D. He also placed uh, several feature requests, uh, issues on GitHub, and I just started implementing them. And uh, accounting Macaroons is, is uh, one of his ideas, or at least it's in his um, uh, feature request. And I saw that, and, and it also mentioned the recurring payments, and I thought, wow, yeah, that's really cool. We need that. Because the, the the really cool thing is, yeah, you can give uh, a macaroon that has a recurring uh, amount on it to any uh, service you use. They themselves have to care about actually getting the money, but you are still fully in control. You can at every time, uh, at any time, delete the account and therefore um, uh, take away their ability to to pull money from you. And for example, with a credit card, it's yeah, it. it can be hard to cancel a subscription or through PayPal or whatever. So you, you're fully self-sovereign in a way that uh, the other person has to care whether they get the money or not, and you are always in control. So I think this can be very powerful. So very cool. So very cool. I mean, one of the one of the one of my little projects I did was with um, an NFC card, so doing like an NFC card payment over Lightning, but then effectively you're giving someone, so the merchant, I mean, it's just proof of concept. So in, in my implementation, when you, when you tap the card, you're giving them the ability, because they've got your macaroon, to go and take all your funds, not just take you know a certain amount of funds. So with your implementation, um, so for, for people who in the US watching this, here in Europe, um, we have like tap and pay on our, on our cards. Um, so we can go up to um, uh, card terminals and if we pay for our coffee, we just get a card and we tap on there. And it's really convenient, really quick. Um, uh, you don't need, obviously you don't need internet access as, a, as, as the, the purchaser, you've just got a card and you just tap and then you pay for your coffee. The security trade-off is, and I know a lot of people who've done this, you lose your card and then someone, so the tap and pay is limited to like, I think it's like a hundred pounds. You can spend a hundred pounds a day. You can only do like three payments. Um, over like 30 quid or something. So it has like limitations. Um, so that's the security trade-off for having that. So obviously the more convenient you make um, something to spend, the the less secure it becomes. You know, like you've, <laughs> you have your Bitcoin locked up in a treasure in a vault in the bottom of some Swiss, you know, mountain hidden away. It's really hard to spend, but it's really secure. So the more, the more, the more, the easier things, the easier you make things to spend, the less secure they become. So you could simulate that card functionality of tap and pay with one of those macaroons and the security trader for that convenience would be that if someone found that card they could then use that macaroon to take out you know that hundred pounds in that day but just like when some when you lose your card in real life um you would just uh so in real life you find the bank company and say can i cancel the card blah 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 whereas in you know bitcoin land in lightning land you would just delete that macaroon and then that person no longer has the ability or delete that account even 
that, yep. the, 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 that card no longer has the ability to be able to withdraw funds. Um, oh, I love it. It's fantastic. Would that work? Yeah, yeah, exactly like you described it. Yes. You, you delete the account, then nobody has access. So and, very cool. And yeah, you, you, could, you, sorry? You, could, you could extend it so like so a lot of people who work in offices. It's very backward in legacy, but I'm a like I I often thinking sort of legacy terms. So in a lot of offices, you have like this um, uh, particularly like governmental buildings and things. You have like a a printer, and then if you want to print something out, you got a fob, and then you got an account, and then you work down your print budget, and then it all needs to be kind of calculated at the end of the month. But with this system, you could have like this is your print budget. Here's a fob. You can spend this much on printing every day or every month or whatever. People can then use that to print stuff out. So it's 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 uh, and you could you could charge that fob with the macaroon to be able to do that from that account. It's so good. Yeah, and it could even be more secure uh, or, or um, at least um, on the card. There's you have a certain logic chip, right? That there, there's some uh, intelligence on it, and you could also make it so that every time you use this uh, tap and pay card, it would again issue a new macaroon that is only valid for two seconds and then so even the the uh, the, the, the merchant doing the the payment could not store it and use it later right so your card could have a, a an infinite macaroon on it just with an account restriction but every time it comes into nfc contact it would issue a new one and restrict it to a few seconds so not even the merchant could do shady stuff with it after this these two seconds well, so, that's super cool. So, they, so if they, so in my system, where if the merchant gets the macaroon, uh, they've still got the macaroons so they can spend technically like a hundred pounds a day or whatever. Whereas with that, they're just getting a one-off. This is a one-off macaroon to enable you to take this much X amount out from here to here, um, and that's it. And then the merchant can then use that macaroon again to get more funds out. That's so cool. Yeah, exactly. So, was this what your talk was uh, predominantly about in in Munich then? Yeah, I explained how the, the setup with the HMAC works, uh, this uh, chain of hashes. I explained how it is used in L&D and what uh, pull requests I'm working on. So all the, the features we hopefully soon will get in L&D, yes. That was what I talked about. What about the, the pull? I mean, I'll put the, so people know, I'll put a link to the um, timestamp um, uh, YouTube, uh, the, 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 the talk, Ollie's talk in the, in the description. Um, uh, so is, has there been much interest around those pull requests on, I mean, the LND GitHub's so crazy, isn't it? So. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, no, they've been sitting there for a while, but uh, yeah, they're, they're very low priority. I, I talked to uh, several people from uh, the Lightning Labs and they say, yeah, it's really cool, but uh, we have much more important stuff. And I agree. It's it's not, yeah, I mean, watchtowers are super important. Uh, static channel backup were really important. So, yeah, I I don't mind. But but uh, I, I saw that they created the whole project. You can uh, make add projects to GitHub. And there's a whole project named uh, Macaroon Evolution. And it basically consists of my pull requests. So, wow. it, uh, well, they still signaled, yeah, we want this, but uh, not, yeah, we don't have time. But every review helps. So if someone wants to play around with it, uh, it's all there. You can all try it out. And if you give feedback on it, like, yeah, it works or it doesn't work or whatever, then that, that of course, helps to speed up the process. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose that the point is that, you know, they've got all these things to, to sort of implement and work on. but. When they get down to to your pull requests of the custom macaroons, which is incredible functionality to add to um, to, to Lightning, um, uh, then it's you know if if it's all like peer reviewed and it's been tested, it makes their job a million times easier. So if there's anyone out there who can help with that, that's great, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I would really appreciate that. Um, what so what so with um with uh, LND, what 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 are some of the um, more interesting uh, things which people? I mean, obviously they've got watchtowers which they're working on, and they got um. Uh, was it static channel uh, backups? Is it that's the yeah? And then uh, what 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 other sort of innovations are they working on at the moment, which you're personally excited about? Uh, 
I think what something that is uh, quite interesting is uh, the new feature. I think it's from the specification of 1.1 1 .1, uh, is the Sphinx payment. So um, payment without the payment request. So like spontaneous payment, you can just connect to a node and say, hey, I, I push some Satoshis to you. Uh, I think that's currently being implemented. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm not sure. Um, and the rest, I think there uh, the, um, the first watchtower implementation that you can s yourself spin up a watchtower will be in point seven, I guess, but I haven't followed the uh, latest merges that closely. Um, no. Yeah, I've been working on a lot of other stuff recently, so uh, I don't know what what else is in the pipeline, but a lot of awesome stuff uh, stuff i'm sure it's i don't even have to go there to know they're working on really cool stuff yeah so with with the sphinx payment that would be like so i could have a so my sweet machine for example i could just have a static qr bit on, you know printed on a bit of paper and dump um i haven't looked into how it's really implemented but i guess yeah that would allow something like that so you put maybe your um public key of your node onto this QR code and then it could, the app could just connect to the node and push a payment, yeah. But I, I don't know, how, I yet have to look into this. Yeah, no, that's really that's really sweet. Uh, brilliant, no, so um, what about questions and things when in, in, in the, the Munich Hack Day? Were there any interesting questions people asked in your talk or? Um, yeah, there was uh, one asking uh, if, if there are already any apps, uh, like uh, mobile apps, using any of the Macaroon features. And uh, yeah, as I said, there is, there's one, um, the, the, the Shango mobile app is, uh, it, it spins up uh, cloud nodes. And because uh, the guy who uh, wrote the app wants to make it uh, as secure as possible, and one of my pull requests enables that there will be no macaroon saved on the actual file system of a node if you do a stateless initialization. So instead of the admin macaroon being created on the hard disk and they're not encrypted by default, it won't create any macaroons, but send it back uh, through the, the, the RPC uh, response. So if you do uh, Alan CLI create or unlock, it won't create a macaroon, but send it back to you. And then you only have it on, on your mobile phone. So everything that is on the cloud node is, is encrypted and there's no encrypted data on it. But apart from that, I have no idea uh, of any other app that does cool stuff with the macaroons yet. So yeah, yeah no, I was... think it's um it's uh just sort of I mean hopefully this video will help people as well like understanding the basic concept of what um will be possible in Lightning and then just from having like th that small caveat you can add to a macaroon, uh suddenly there's like a gazillion use cases which suddenly yeah. open up uh, and businesses and business opportunities and uh, apps and things. So uh people can start thinking about um um implementing some of those things uh, or, or you know you know just thinking about what what some of those apps or whatever might might look like um so uh yeah i know it's absolutely fantastic and um so macaroons themselves i know that i know because i was speaking to one of your friends and they said that you're so obsessed by macaroons they actually bought you like a macaroon baking tray or something uh, <laughs> yeah yeah, um, we uh, we went uh, last year, uh, spring last year, we went to Greece. We rented the Airbnb apartment, uh, like four four of us, just some geeks from the, the local meetup. And yeah, we were there and hacked on stuff like this for a month. So we went to Greek, Greece for a month to hack on Lightning and Bitcoin stuff. And that was uh, when I wrote most of my pull requests. So some of them are over a year old. Um, and yeah, of course, I mentioned a lot about macaroons and maybe I went on their nerves. And yeah, so it became like a running gag. And yes, he actually bought me a, a baking tray for macaroons, <laughs> which you, is super you, awesome. <laughs> have you used it yet? Have you actually made it? Not any yet, no. Yet? I, I was so busy coding. Uh, <laughs> I'm not big uh, in baking myself, but I will use it, yes, eventually. 
that's a that's an absolutely brilliant idea as well yes. for anyone else out there to, to to get together with a bunch of other hackers even i mean even if you don't even have to be that technically good but being able to dedicate an amount of time to working on stuff like and if you have like people with a shared interest then in my experience you always come out with something interesting yeah um, yes um, so yeah, I very much encourage other people to do um, uh, similar similar things if they if they can. I mean, I've spoken to a couple of Bitcoiners um, at some of these uh, Bitcoin conferences, and I know some of them are setting up like you know hubs. And um, uh, I got a friend who set up something in uh, Sicily, uh, which is very similar, like a hack space. People can go to spend a month here, a month there, just working on their projects, like an incubator type scenario. Um, so the more of that that we get, I think I think the better. Um, Okay, brilliant. So, is there anything else to add? Do you think, or so? Where, where can people like catch up with your stuff? Then, I mean, they can go to the. Is it so? It's would the macaroon stuff be on your? Or it's on the L and D, of course. Um, but have, have you got your own GitHub or um, you got your Twitter or? Yeah, I've uh, got my Twitter, as you mentioned, T U G O L. Um, I, I'm there with my normal uh, clear clear name so um full name um also on github no, was I mean, my I mean, full we, name <laughs> we, 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 were, we were joking around about this weren't we, we were saying about yeah. the thing and i think that any bitcoiner i think even if you just use like i mean look at the hodl not thing like just using twitter for a period of time and then eventually putting a picture of you yeah a hand or whatever or like your security wears away uh, occasionally, like at a Bitcoin conference or a meetup, I'll meet someone and I'll say, oh, are you on Twitter? Are you on, you're on anything? And they say, no, no, I'm not on anything. No social media platforms, no this, no that. And I'm like, yeah, there we are. That's good OPSEC. Um, but as soon as you put yourself out there, then, you know, people can find you if they want to. So yeah. Yeah, I think you can make it a little bit harder for them. But um, I mean, neither of us have any Bitcoin anyway. So no, I lost all of them in a boating okay. accident. So yeah, it's, I'm really just a developer doing, doing some stuff and yeah, never had yeah, any no. Bitcoin. No, <laughs> no none of us, I none lost of us all of them. That's the problem. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. How do you work in Switzerland? Just one, one final. How do you work on Switzerland on, um, cause I know Germany, they have like insanely favorable laws. Like if you keep your Bitcoin for a year, you don't have to be paying tax on them. Um, how does it work on Switzerland? Because I know in Switzerland you have some privacy when it comes to like assets and things. Um, can you do you have to declare that you have Bitcoin? Um, yeah, and then you do. Yeah, okay. you do. Um, uh, a friend of mine even asked, "Yeah, so what about all the forks and the shit coins?" And someone actually investigated it, and he got the response, "Yeah, okay, just put in the the four or so most known forks, and you can yeah just sum it up to into Bitcoin, and then yeah just add a number in Bitcoin." And, oh, I like it. And yeah. because uh, I think the in general, if you have a um, property uh, up to 100,000 100, Swiss francs, you don't pay property tax on it. And if you have more, then you pay a very, very small amount on it. So it, it just goes into this category of, of uh, property or, or not. It's probably not even the right term, like your assets in, in general. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think you pay uh, the rate is something like for one million Swiss francs you pay like one thousand francs per year in taxes. So it's, it's yeah, not not a huge amount. That's it's why helpful. everyone wants uh, to live in Switzerland to store the money here. Right? Yeah, I mean every time I've been to Switzerland, it's funny when you cross the Italian border and like I mean you're in Italy and Lake Como, it's lovely. You know, it's a pretty gorgeous, wonderful, you know, affluent place. But then as soon as you get into like Lugano, that's like another, 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 you step up in the kind of wealth and there's all these Italians driving around in fancy cars and you think, okay, this is probably where your money is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, no, no, Switzerland's gorgeous, love it. And also Bern, um, we went to Bern and uh, obviously that's where Einstein lived, wasn't it? And did most of yeah. his work. So, yeah, well, I was going to say, not only did you do most of your good work in Bern, but you actually did in Greece. So. <laughs> yeah, that's true, yes. <laughs> um, but I really like, because there's the clock in Bern where Einstein was looking at the clock and he's on a bus or a tram or whatever, and he was moving away from the clock. And he thought, if I went faster, would the, the hands on the clock slow down? And that's where he came up with like his idea of relativity. Is that, that's, I think that's correct, isn't really? it? Really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Know yeah, you know the, okay. yeah. Where his house is and you've got the clock, he was looking at the clock going on a tram moving away from it. But what they don't say, because I saw this in a couple of documentaries, like science -y documentaries, in Bern, you've got those like 
uh, aqueducty, streamy things running through all the streets, haven't you? So he would have been on the little bus, moving away from the clock, looking at the clock, and then also you've got this running water, like running past it much faster. Um, and he would have been thinking about, you know, light and time and all this stuff. Uh, so uh, it's funny. So you didn't know that? No, I didn't know that. Yeah, so, it's typical, it's, it? When it's you live typical, somewhere, yeah. you don't know the local. You don't know <laughs> yeah, the that's true. You've got to be a tourist and they come and do all the tourist yeah. tours and stuff. But well, I'm both to be honest, I'm not that interested in, in, in history. Yeah, my science history maybe, but history in general is uh, not really my uh, yeah, favorite topic. But but Bern is a very inspiring city. So, I uh, yeah, you should all come and have a real-life Blocchino and then stroll along the river because it's really, really nice, yeah. And then jump in the river. Yes, yeah. <laughs> It is really, really nice because the, the water is so clear and refreshing. And, it is, it is right. Yeah. But if, if anyone who doesn't know, like the, the river in Bern, Google it. It's one. It, as a child, it's the sort of water you're told never to go near because it's like all swirly and there's clearly millions of currents and things. It just looks dangerous and it's running extremely fast. And then everyone in Bern just leaps in it, and like it, it's dangerous. It is dangerous. It is <laughs> yes. Um, but uh, when I'm, I'm, cause I was, I was in it, and you're shooting along the, this river, and then you have to like grab these bars to pull yourself out. It's quite cool because like if you're outside the city, you can jump in the river with like a waterproof bag, and then go into the city, get out, put your clothes on, and then just walk around. And a lot of people do that; don't they use it as transport. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I was in there, and I was thinking, this is, man, this is dangerous. And I, I grabbed the thing and I pulled myself out. And then behind me, getting out, was like a pregnant woman with a dog. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you have to be a good swimmer. Uh, it, it can be dangerous, and unfortunately, unfortunately, a lot of uh, tourists, uh, or most of the accidents, are actually tourists because you, you tend to underestimate uh, these currents and stuff. But yeah, we we learn from an early age that you need to be a good swimmer to go into the river, and yeah, so. <laughs> it's much worth like, it so much like much like bitcoin and controlling your own money so you learn yeah. how to manage it properly and then exactly. and then you don't and then you don't have these uh these accidents and disasters so you give people autonomy and you teach them and they learn and then and then they're less likely to make those mistakes so that's probably a good i don't know how we might bring it back around to bitcoin um <laughs> yes <laughs> no i love burn it's great uh okay thank you so much ali um that's well that thank you and like just learning about macaroons because so, I mean, I, I, I don't know enough about them. So, um, I mean, I know that some of them are bigger than others and some of them let you do more things than others. So, um, and then also to think of all these custom macaroons and um, they got the macaroon bakery thing, I think they're trying to work on as well, weren't they? Which is like, I mean, is that basic? That's basically being able to add those caveats um, uh, like you discussed. Yeah. Um, and and these by are all... the way, sorry, um, you, could you maybe also add a link to the show notes uh, to my slides that I showed in uh, in Munich? It's all on my GitHub page. So gukero.github.io, you find the link to the slides. And there, because I, I added some um, detailed graphics uh, or I know uh, how it works. So if you want to have a look there, it's my, it maybe idea. also helpful, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'll put I'll put all that stuff um, uh, when we stop broadcasting. Now we can give me a list of all the stuff, and I will stick it yes. on the show notes. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much, Ali. And um, um, as soon as I get down to Burn, the next time I get down to Burn, I'm going to be giving you a call. And um, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yes. I'm kind of have a beer. All right, brilliant. Uh, cheers so much, Ali. And um, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, and I uh, wish you a nice weekend. <laughs>